So now do you see <laughs> the yes. right thing? Okay, perfect. So yep. I'm going to try and go quickly through this. So I can't imagine, I feel like we've repeated this a number of times, but again, Fathomnet is beta. It is not even at version one. And so what I want to talk about at least is what we're hoping to do in order to get there. Um, so obviously, you know, we're really excited to be able to be getting feedback from you all. I know the first hour of discussions have been really interesting and I can't wait for us to capture that as we as we step forward. Uh, so uh, getting Fathomnet to beta or from beta to 1.0, our goal is to try and do uh, the 1.0 launch before the end of the year. Uh, I say that now, of course, deadlines can shift, but to try and kind of capture all of the different uh, tasks that our group, but also the community will, will probably be involved in. There's there's quite a bit. So first, um, I wanted to point out that, you know, on the bottom, we're going to have the planned goals and then the top are pending. And by pending, that means it's dependent on the information that you all share with us as part of the, the workshop. Uh, so for planned activities, uh, so we're, we're, we submitted the Fathom application finally uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, if you're reviewing that paper, please be nice uh, in advance. Uh, but you can also take a look at that uh, paper. It's, it's posted up on archive, and I believe we link to it on the web page in the About Us section. Uh, the next phase of this project is benchmarking, benchmarking generalized use cases. And so our group has spent a lot of time kind of brainstorming what might be some generalized use cases uh, that would be valuable for the community, but also like what would be the kinds of models that we could uh, be spending time uh, curating or maintaining over time uh, as we get more and more data into Fathomnet. And so some of these generalized use cases we come up with, and again, this is not the end all be all list. This is just one that we came up with. And of course, we would love to get input from the community. Um, the first is a what we're calling a megalodon detector or meg detector. It's a bit of a riff on the, the terrestrial mega detector. And the idea here is this object detector would be trained on Fathomnet, which will provide detections of objects in visual data. So again, based on the objects or classes that exist within Fathomnet. And then the idea is, you know, as we grow Fathomnet, obviously the classes aren't going to be great or fantastic, but we can ignore class output and just use it as a detector so that we know where objects are in, in the image. Uh, the next uh, one is a midwater super category animal object detector, as well as a benthic super category animal object detector. And so we've actually posted our a benthic super category animal object detector already on the Fathomit model zoo. That's been though trained primarily on benthic animals found in the Eastern Pacific, because that was using Mbari uh, 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 label data. But the idea is that we could provide a super, super category models for these different groups so that if you know you don't have any localizations to start out with, you can at least get you know higher either class name or family name, um, you know, super category classes associated with some lo localizations to get you started. Uh, the next model that we've talked a lot about, and this has actually come out of many, many, many discussions with uh, different individuals um, is the fact that a vulnerable marine ec ecosystems object detector would be really valuable. Um, so I was really inspired by the, the talk that Amy Baco gave at the International Seabed Authority. And you know, the, there's a lot of members of that, that group within the marine imaging community that's trying to figure out ways or metrics to define uh, vulnerable marine ecosystems. And so we'd love to work with that group to think about, you know, what might be some of the concepts or the benthic animals that we would need to, you know, train an object detector for to help indicate where regions are either vulnerable or, or can be defined as vulnerable or not. Uh, and then the last thing is distribution ships, ships, shifts which uh, is something that Eric Gorenstein, one of our team members, is spending a lot of time thinking about. In fact, he's going to be submitting a paper on this pretty shortly. Uh, it's this idea of, you know, if you train an algorithm and then you try and deploy it either in a different place or using a different camera or at a different time or if the conditions are slightly different, that model doesn't perform very well. So it's called a distribution shift. And this is a, a, a problem, a known problem within the computer science or the computer vision communities. And so what Eric is going to do is present 
uh, FathomNet as a rich source of distribution shifts uh, to try and you know, present it as uh, a, an important use case for the, the computer science community. So we'll be uh, benchmarking those as well. Uh, besides benchmarking, we're also going to be implementing the Megalodon detector or the Meg detector. And the idea of the implementation is that we can use the Meg detector to generate metrics like percent coverage which I'll explain a little bit later, but then also with engagement, perhaps create a Twitter bot. Uh, so this is actually the, the model server front end uh, that Ben Woodward, Woodward, Woodward spun up uh, at CVision AI. And so what it's doing, it's actually running the, uh, the Mbari Benthic super category object detector. And you can, uh, run or, or point the, the server to a particular image in your collection. And what it'll do is it'll output, you know, the, the localization as well as the class that it thinks the object corresponds to, you know, based on the classes that it is currently trained on. And so, like I said, this is a useful, it's a, it's a, it's a benthic object detector. We haven't actually incorporated midwater classes yet, but what's really, I think valuable for um, operations like this and how it might be related to, to FathomNet in the future is, is the fact that, you know, if you submit an image or, you know, a series of images, you know, your particular group might be interested in localizing just fish or just coral, uh, when in fact there's a lot of other objects in that image. And so what we're hoping for with FathomNet is that imagery has 100% coverage, meaning all of the object in that image has been labeled uh, and localized. And so what this, this model server will allow us to do is if you upload an image, I want to um, point you to the top, uh, the top text so that we can come up with metrics for whether or not the whole image has, has been covered. So for reference, the blue uh, rectangles correspond to the manual annotation, and then the yellow or very bright green uh, rectangle corresponds to the model output. And then we do a, an intersection over union to compare the two. And so the green area indicates you know, where there's, there's overlap. And so in this particular case, we have 100% coverage and the, the machine learning model missed 0% of it, right? So it was 100% accurate. And then this is another example running that same benthic object detector, but again, on a midwater animal, it's classified as a fish, but again, don't, don't pay attention to the classifications. But in this case, we've got 100% coverage, but 0% uh, ML missed. But now in benthic situations, right, we would expect to see a lot more variability. But remember, yellow is the, um, the, the, the proposals that this particular algorithm is presented with, uh, and the blue is the manual labels. And so you can see that the, the manual labels missed a lot of animals. And I'm not saying that the ML is 100% accurate, but at least gives us a starting point, right, if we're trying to curate this data and add information to it. And then here's another example of you know what a, another benthic image could look like and then in situations like these where you have really really dense fields you can already see you know again yellow is that that machine model uh and then the 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 blue indicates the manual annotations and you can see we're already picking up a lot more objects than we would have if we only relied on the manual input but you could also see that the machine learning model missed some of these uh, annotations as well. So the point is, is if we have a model like this, it can at least enrich the data to some level that we can then run with within the FathomNet database. But we can also do kind of fun things like this, you know, run models on objects that uh, obviously the classes have, haven't been, or the models haven't been trained on. Uh, we can also run this on memes. And I think this is a funny image because Obviously, it's a response to how poorly our object detector classifies uh, Captain Picard. And so one of the things that we're going to try and do is incorporate this into a Twitter bot and help provide engagement uh, with the FathomNet data set. So in addition to this, we are uh, going to also integrate ORCIDs into user registration. And so it will look something like this, where in your profile, you'll be able to add your contact information as well as potentially your ORCID. And this is going to be important as we start thinking about database versioning or trying to provide attribution for people's contributions to the database. 
the next thing is that we're actually in the process of finalizing an agreement with NOAA uh, that goes over a database versioning as well as hosting data. So it's not finalized yet. So, you know, there's, there's always, there's a little uncertainty here. But as part of the agreement, uh, NOAA and CEI has offered to um, uh, host versions of the database and provide mechanisms for us to version the database every six months. And during that period, they can generate a DOI so that when you are submitting data to FathomNet, your contribution would be signed to that, assigned to that DOI that would correspond to the next version of the database. So that would be the mechanism by which you could get the DOI for your data contribution into FathomNet. And the other thing that we're trying to work on, oops, is that uh, we're also trying to, sorry. So what happens is, is then when you submit your data uh, to the to FathomNet and in the Darwin Core metadata for your data set, what you will get out of this process will be a DOI for your particular contribution. And not only that, we're also, uh, as part of the agreement, trying to finalize uh, a mechanism for data hosting through NOAA. So if you have data and you don't have a mechanism for getting that data on public URLs, NOAA might be able to help us provide a solution for that. But keep in mind that NOAA, NOAA data it has to be made public. So you know if you have any personal concerns about usage of your data, you would probably have to find some other solution. But again, these are ongoing discussions and negotiations, and we're happy to uh, incorporate any suggestions that you might have uh, from, the, from the community as we move forward. But now I wanna talk about this process from the perspective of the workshop. So as you all know, we are here in April, and what we're going to do is try to share the workshop materials with you all, you know, the video recordings, et cetera, uh, and do that in a couple weeks and then compile a workshop report. Uh, we wanna share that report with you all to get input and the, with the goal of helping us to come up with prioritized tasks, where then we'll spend some time defining development tasks and timelines with a very ambitious goal of trying to implement some of those prioritized features in time for the FathomNet version 1.0 release. And so if that looks like a lot of things, it's because it is. Uh, and so if there are any volunteers, we're definitely open to more volunteers, but frankly, we're also open to more collaborators because as you can imagine, this is a pretty big effort and we'll only succeed with, you know, continued input and engagement from, from you all. So with that, I'll try and get us on time. So if you have any questions for me before we head to a break, I am happy to take them. Do we need a permit from the other collaborators to fathom it? So my question is related to a previous message, but we have videos from Ephraim, from Mari, from OT, from Mbari. And, uh, so those from Mbari, they go directly because you have them too from the Gulf of California, but um, from the other cruises, can we use those as well? These have videos and they, we have annotations from them. So Elva, which which videos are you talking about? I, I may have seabed, seabed um, uh, habitats and, and, and um, fauna and taxonomic uh, videos from the seafloor, from Guaymas Basin, from Revillajedo National Park, and others well it depends on right who the source like who actually owns that footage okay. I, I should say we already have an agreement right Ben with uh, with the with NOAA OER to get their visual data into uh, into Tater uh, we also have that agreement already in place for um, for National Geographic Society some of their data uh, although they have a lot of data that are still embargoed um, so, so Elva, if you can let us know or let your data data provider know that that's something that yeah. you're interested in, we're happy. Okay, yeah, this is uh, what I put in my message. This is Ipremier, Marum, and Ocean Exploration Trust. Okay. 
if I can tie in real quick, this is not FathomNet specific, right? This is this is depends on what these institutions, their policy is for you sharing their data. It's not necessarily a FathomNet uh, policy or limitation. Okay, it, it is just the use of having the annotations and then identify them with your system, because we have our own homemade system, which is really almost doing everything by hand. Right. Okay. Anyone else? Tugel has his hands up. You want a break right now? Sorry, we have 10 minutes for a break. It's fine if you want to stay and ask questions, but if anybody else needs to break, um, and then we'll go straight into the breakouts um, for more discussion at in 10 minutes. Katie, hey, hey, can you explain how huh? those breakups are going to happen? How do people just pick their rooms or do they get assigned randomly based on the you'll get, you'll get assigned based on your, um, you know, what group you have in your uh, in your name, just so that we can make sure that there's a relatively equal number in each group. Yeah, we will do the assignments. All right, thank you, everybody. And if you have questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. while madly um, getting these rooms set up. This is also a quick reminder for those who haven't added a category in their names to please do so. Um, I see a few names in there who haven't added which category they'd be like to be assigned to, whether it's educator, enthusiast, uh, taxonomist, or programmer. And if you're Isn't in between, the pick the, the one you'd like to be. So if you can put it at the beginning of the name, that's even better. That would be way better. Yeah, Dougal. Uh, I wonder for, I, I was looking to upload some stuff to Fathom that earlier today and uh, came against that you have to get copyright from any images and most of the images I have are from other people who've asked me what's this, what's that. Uh, and I can see how it would be possible to send in a model that we've trained ourselves and then that could be used to extract uh, the correct labels from other data that you might have, not necessarily the data that I've got. So there's a workaround in that respect. So I wonder if there's a way to use that annotated data of Elvis to make a model, not having it in front in FathomNet and train it and then use that to try and use that taxonomic expertise kind of get around that problem. That's a, I mean, that's a good question. Obviously, we want to be creative. Uh, but I also want to let you know that like, we have talked with Ocean Exploration and Trust, and, and Katie knows that group extremely well. Um, they're they're interested in, in contributing their data to FathomNet, actually. Um, and we've also talked about it more recently with them about about Tater or this this this, this broader next step that we will we'll talk a little bit at the end. Um, I don't know. I'm cautiously optimistic that. We're, we're, we're going to start to see these these groups, these data providers being open to having their information provided um, into these systems. But she listed OET, she, what, what other group did she list? Ifermer, I know Ifermer is actually reaching out and, and starting to make contributions to FathomNet. The only thing that I guess they might not have had already in place, but again, this is all moving or changing, right? is the, the external data hosting capability. I know that's that's tripping up Tim Schoening, at least the conversations I've had with him about trying to get data from Guillemore. Uh, but I think what we're starting to see is, as at least, you know, these different groups, where what we all seem to be narrowing down to like solutions or interfaces or standards so that all these different systems can talk um, better with each other. Yeah, I don't think you'll have a trouble, uh, any problems with the people dealing with the data in those areas. It's the taxonomists who have their own collections or, or, or things like that, that I think there might be another way to leverage it. Right. And we're, and we're guilty of that too in Ambari, right? So it's, well, I think the, t the onus is on us to make it very clear what people will get out of that contribution. And and so, you know, trying to provide these different services or algorithms, demonstrate that these things work uh, is, is on us, right, in order to get people to change their minds. 
I don't think it's a problem with them not wanting to provide the data. It's a problem with them going, I've got this image I have ID'd. I can't remember who sent it to me or anything like that. And if you're able to harvest that and make a model without them having to actually send that image out into the World Wide Web so that they could get past any corporate copyright problems, but you could still use the that identification, uh, I think that would be very useful. Yeah. We need we need the image data though for it to be useful for Fathomnet at least. You need well, we, it in what, the system, not necessarily exposed. <laughs> one of the models we have is actually trained on data that's not in Fathomnet. So I think that's that's what I'm hearing is that if there's ability for someone to make a model on that data that's not necessarily public and contribute it that model to Fathomnet, then it could be used more broadly on data. I think that is a valid pathway for, you know, obviously we would prefer to have the data within Fathomnet and shared, but in in the interim, while all that is resolved, you know, being able to contribute models on data that's not able to contribute will help, I think. Yeah, yeah. and then if you can approach the people who were the originators of that data saying, look how it's able to automatically ID your stuff, then you'll get yourself in a positive feedback loop. Hopefully. Right. No, that's a good point. I mean, I, I should have said, you know, that's actually one of the things that we're already doing at Ambari. We're training models on even the embargo data, but we're sharing them, sharing the models. And so then people are then using those models for their particular use case. Uh, thanks, Dougal. Uh, 